Welcome to the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast. My name is Don Bishop, and I write as T.S. Pedramon. Today I bring you an interview with author Marla Jimeta, who writes historical fantasy, and uh, we had a fascinating conversation that you're about to hear, uh, because I, I noticed, I found her online as um, another author who does music. Now, if, if you know, if you've been following the podcast for a while, then you know that my book, um, this one back here, has uh, a song or, or a couple of songs in it. Um, and there's one in particular that, that I am going to, you know, f- produce and share with my Kickstarter backers. And beyond that, I, I haven't really settled exactly all the details. But so I, I saw that her her book, the book, excuse me, <laughs> just book one in her series is called Master of Music. And I just, I had to reach out to her and invite her on the podcast and, and have a talk about uh, music in fantasy. So that's what's coming up in a few minutes. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to her about the title of her upcoming book two, Cry of the Kestrel, uh, which I appreciate for personal reasons. I just, I like kestrels. They're, they're cute little falcons. And uh, when my wife and I were expecting our first child, uh, we, we like the surprise of when the baby is born, whether it's a boy or a girl. And so we spent the nine months and we, we knew it was going to be a girl, but we didn't officially know. Like, you know, that we asked doctors not to um, if if they had any test that revealed that, not to let us know. Um, but yeah, we knew. We knew with all three of our kids um, if it was going to be a boy or a girl. Anyway, so while we were expecting our first child, we, since we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl, we couldn't choose a name. Like some people, do, they name their baby six months out or even before even ever getting married. But They'll name their baby six months out, and we're like, well, how are you going to name the baby if you don't know if it's a boy or girl? So we couldn't say, like, oh, you know, John, when in, when John is born, we couldn't do that. Um, so our baby had a code name, and the code name was Kestrel, because we didn't want to keep saying the baby, the baby, the baby. Um, yeah, so when, when uh, it was Kestrel. So I always liked the word before, and I liked the bird before, but... It's it's special to me as well. Anyway, so um, before we get into the interview, just uh, I'll I'll give you some kind of announcements of what we have going on. Um, not industry wide. I'm not one of those podcasts. If you want like industry news, uh, you can you can go and check those podcasts out. I I listen to them. I find them helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Next week, we're going to have another interesting conversation, which is not recorded yet, so I guess it could turn out to be a dud. But no, I expect it to be really intriguing. Uh, We're going to have Noah Healy on, who is not an author. Uh, In fact, looking at his matchmaker.fm profile, where I've I've found some upcoming guests, and I've I've found a few podcasts that I'm going to be on as a guest uh, in the near future. Um... His profile says he's an experienced public speaker, conversationalist, uh, and a recreational mathematician, which I think is intriguing. Um, I mean, I, I like math as well. I, I, I'm probably not as advanced as he is. You know, I, I made it through high school, did some college math. Um, not a ton, though, because that just that wasn't my major. But, um, and my my major wasn't terribly math heavy but uh, anyway so I was going to say that he he talks about like um, marketplace and game theory and he likes philosophy cooking and, and fiction so well hey you know fiction there we are but um, yeah we're, we're, we're planning to talk about um, the progress of technology and and where reality meets sci-fi um, and kind of where that's where that's going to be now and where it's going to be in the future so tune in next week for that uh, sorry not uh, yeah that's next week yep next week and then the following week 
we're going to have um, author Herman Hunter back on. Uh, he was on earlier in April. But um, now I, I pointed my book back here. Um, so that this podcast is brought to you by my book. Uh, the series is called Nightshade Unicorn. Book one is called Forerunner. So I'm going to tell you what's going on with it right now because if you see this right here, this is Kickstarter fulfillment. I ran the Kickstarter campaign in January of this year and um, the paperbacks arrived first and then the hardcovers arrived uh, very recently. And so... I'm I'm working to get these organized and send them out to the backers who ordered these copies, um, and you know I'm I'm doing things like making book plates as well uh, because some people requested a signed book plate. Um, there were a few people who who preferred to have the book delivered straight to them from the printer. So once uh, once everything was all prepped, I went into the into Ingram Spark and I I place that order and had it delivered straight to them but they still want a signature which is fine because now I can mail them this thing signed and uh, they can just peel off the back and and stick it inside the front cover just like that but um, yeah that's what's going on um, right now and that's uh, yeah that's a lot of work going on um my newsletter. If you are subscribed to my newsletter, you may have noticed that I haven't sent out a few issues. Uh, I've just been super busy, super terribly busy, um, and I haven't been able to get that done. Now I, I'm still. That's still a thing. That's still a thing I'm doing. I've just I've missed a few issues, um, so don't feel like you're you're missing out. It's coming. Um, the next one I might go ahead and send out without. A short story. Uh, I was working on one. I, I still am working on one, but it might turn out to be more of a novella uh, or even a short novel. Um, whoopsie! <laughs> I just I can't get it. I can't get all the good details in um, in the short story format. Um, so yeah. And uh, I guess that uh, that concludes our announcements for now. Um, but yeah, check us out uh, next week. Check out the book. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, just search for Nightshade Unicorn. That is, um, that will, I'll I'll be up near the top, if not at the top. You can Google it also. Um, of course, you can buy it directly from me at GrandHill.media. But. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to come back on for announcements after the interview. I'm just going to go ahead and let the episode end after that because it is half an hour to midnight on Wednesday night and I need to get this out. But um, yeah, we'll catch you next time on the, Grand Hill Chroni yeah, on the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast. And now enjoy this interview with author Marla Jimeta. All right, uh, today I am here with author Marla Jimeta and uh, we are going to talk about fantasy and music but first Marla let's get to know you a little bit better how did you get into writing whoa um, okay that's <laughs> I don't know I started writing from the time I can remember actually just scribbling stories down um, all the time so I'd say I've been writing since I was probably about five um, yeah my house uh, my family life was not very calm. <laughs> it was pretty tempestuous. And uh -huh. to escape it, I would run across the street and climb this big tree. And um, I had a secret <laughs> hiding place up there where I had a, there was a hole in the tree. And I had a, a plastic wrapped journal that I kept in there. And I would just go up there and sit on a huge branch and write story after story after story, <laughs> um, just story. They always had the same theme, you know, some somebody who was misunderstood and and overcame obstacles and, and survived no matter what kind of thing. Um, yeah, uh -huh. and then I could see down from the tree, I could see my house across the street. And uh, when one or other of the parent would leave, I knew it was safe and I'd go back home again. And that's kind of how I started writing. I, that sounds kind of weird, but... 
that's what I did. I didn't really realize that our family life was unusual. I, I guess when you're a kid, it's whatever is normal is normal. To me, that was totally normal. Mm -hmm. I didn't think a thing of it. Um, you know, it's just that's what you did when things got, you know, started to fly. <laughs> I would leave and just go do that. Yeah. You know, we had seven people in the house and it, it got pretty uh, tense sometimes. So that's how I started writing um, pretty much. And uh, as far as this particular series goes, um, I started that about, uh, I would say about 35 years ago. Um, I have four kids wow. and I would uh, tell them stories, you know, before bedtime every night. And that's how I, that I thought that was the best way to instill moral values, whatever you want to call it, in my kids was not to lecture them, but to do it in story form, you know, have a have a character, just you know, do it for me, and um, they loved it and it worked great, and I've got four great adults now to show for it, so I guess it worked, but <laughs> but that's what I did, and yeah. and uh, I started to write a story about or not write but tell a story about a boy who followed a master and the boy had this incredible gift of music and um, that story resonated with my kids so much that I just kept telling it night after night I just kept you know broadening the story out and um, we live I live in Hawaii and we have a view pretty close to our house I can see the Ko'olau, uh, the Ko'olau Mountains are right in front of us, but I can see Mount Olomana, and Mount Olomana has two peaks, so it's like a twin peak mountain. You can only see the two peaks at a certain angle, and at a certain angle, to me, it looks like there. I can imagine a heart between the two, you know, expanding from one peak to the other. And that gave me the idea of harps, and that made me think of the Bards of Ireland, and that made me think of what if this kid was growing up there. Uh, and what if music really did have the power I'm talking about, you know, because to me, it does. I mean, to me, my, mm -hmm. my books almost belong in nonfiction, you know, because it's that is my experience when I play music. Um, what I'm describing is very, very real to me. Uh, and I think it is to most musicians. So um, I started to incorporate that into my story and started to do some research about uh, Ireland and about you know, what would happen, what time period did I want to put it in, and um, the Bards of Ireland, turns out, disappeared in history at about the same time the Druids appeared in Ireland, and that was interesting to me. Um, nobody knows what happened to them. They, they just sort of assume they got assimilated, or they, they left, or they became wandering minstrels, whatever. Nobody really knows, and so I thought, oh, wonderful, I know, you know. <laughs> I can figure this out. So um, that's uh -huh. where my fantasy begins is with me explaining, you know, what happened to the Bards of Ireland. So so that's where the whole thing began, really. And so I started incorporating um, musical instruments into the Bardic Isles and creating a whole, a whole society for them. Um, they left Ireland. They were driven out by the Druids. And I won't say why, because that's all part of book three. And... Um, they found a, an island, a set of islands, five islands, called the Bardic Isles, that are off the uh, western coast of Ireland, far enough away that you can't see them from the coast. And um, the power of their music discovered it, and they, their whole society is based on music. So it becomes an intrinsic part of their culture and about, about what they're all about. So, yeah. This is... Um this kind of takes place in a, uh, an alternate earth. Like it's, no, it's, 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 it's this, this earth. earth. But a it's this bit. earth. That's why it is technically a historical fantasy. Well, but I mean, um, cause you're, you're inserting the, the Bardic Isles. Right. Like, now the Bardic um, Isles are an island that have not, that had never been discovered and haven't been to this day, but it doesn't mean they aren't out there. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. and, okay. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So everything else is, is factual. So I did, tons of research i have tons of gigabytes of files of research on ireland so every time i describe I, I couldn't have anything in the bardic isles that couldn't exist in ireland so every tree every <laughs> every type of rock the the ground underneath um music can even go with the elements so i had to watch the wind currents the whole nine yards you know uh -huh. so yeah i made it very much this earth <laughs> I, I should have had my wife in on this call. She um she's a bit of an Ireland file. How do you, how do you 
<laughs> anyway, she yeah, she loves she loves things Ireland. Yeah. Um, we always try to have some corned beef and cabbage for th- St. Patrick's Day. Oh wow! Uh, and yeah, you know she she likes that yeah, stuff. It's, well, I like it too. You would but, like the setting then, uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's great. Um, so why don't you tell us your background with music? And I I know in in our emails you mentioned that you. You teach clarinet and piano? Yeah, I do. Um, I've been a musician, I guess, most of my life. I That's what I majored in. I was a piano performance major. So um, I was basically trained to become a, you know, um, concert pianist. And I did not like the lifestyle. Uh, it's constant traveling. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I wanted kids. I wanted a family. Um, uh-huh. And I didn't see that being compatible yeah. unless I was willing to have somebody else raise my kids, which I wasn't. And I've never been a big fan yeah. of performing anyway i mean done a lot of it heaven knows but i don't that's not my thing i really prefer teaching so i I had some amazing mentors in my life without which i would never have become the musician i did and i wanted to do for other people what they did for me they changed my life i weren't for them you know i I don't know what would have happened to me you know my my home life probably would have had more of an impact on me if it weren't for them um you know, they became really almost my pseudo parents. So, so that was yeah. really neat. And my parents couldn't afford lessons. Uh, they couldn't afford instruments. We did have a piano. It was a, it was a beat up old Wurlitzer. Um, and my dad was had an amazing ear. I mean, he was the musician in the family for sure. He he was really good. I think um, I'm trying to remember if we have a Wurlitzer. We have we have two pianos actually. Not. Not, not this guy. Mm-hmm. This guy is electronic. I'm not. I'm not counting mm. that one. It's good, but it's it's basic. Um, no, we have two real live wooden upright pianos, yeah. and one of them is a a spinet piano, and it, it that might be the Wurlitzer. Yeah. Uh, the other one is a um, it's a player piano. What's the other term they like to use? A, a concert upright or something upright grand, but. Mm-hmm. Um, that one, oh, I I don't remember. They're they're both old pianos, you know, because we I got my degree in music education, uh-huh, uh-huh. and I uh, I taught for a year, and then I joined the Marine Corps and and played clarinet oh, for the wow. Marine Corps for several years. So we didn't have tons of money. We have, um, you know, one piano we got at the Salvation Army. Yeah. Uh, another one that we got, um, we found it on Facebook Marketplace. Actually, we have three pianos, but the other one is in another state wow. uh, at our old house that we're renting out. Huh. So, yeah, I didn't um, get a good piano for years. Um, then my, my uh, parents couldn't afford lessons, so they did manage. My dad was insistent that I get lessons because he never had them and couldn't read music for beans. He did everything by ear, and he always regretted that. So he wanted me hmm. to be sure that I got the right kind of training to begin with, but they could only afford what they could and the teacher they got was terrible he smoked a cigar and stared out the window while i demolished book after book you know and so i knew nothing about technique nothing about musical expression nothing about relaxation um and then so i marched up to my mom one day when i was about in fifth grade i said you know what i quit because i'm not getting anywhere and it hurts my shoulders hurt my wrists hurt my fingers hurt i was playing level 10 music and typing it perfectly with zero expression, zero understanding of the music. And it was not fun. It was it was awful. So I just said, I can't get any better. There's no sense I waste your guys' money. I quit. And uh, so she went, well, you can't quit, you know, because <laughs> you're good at it. And I'm going, well, you're good at it or not. It is, I'd rather listen to music than play it. It's too painful. So they, um, mm-hmm. she found out through my youth symphony director a good uh a good pianist, the best in the, in the whole Seattle area. Cause I grew up in Seattle. Um, she, uh, was named Madam Jacobson. She was a Russian lady, tall Russian lady, didn't mince words, uh, very elderly at the time. And, uh, she said, she'll tell you what she thinks. She won't take her as a student cause she's retired, but she'll tell you in no uncertain terms what to do. We went to her and she just uh-huh. stabbed a grand piano and said, go play. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so I sat down, I typed up La Campanella, you know, by list. Um, and I loved it because it was like a grand piano. I'd never even seen one before. It was wonderful. And it was so responsive. All the staccatos just popped out of my fingers. It was really cool. Um, 
And then uh-huh. afterwards, she had a fit. She she just blew up right in our faces. Who has done this to you? You know, big, strong Russian accent. We have here God-given talent. Does this grow on trees? No, it does not. You know, she was just really upset. She wanted to know the name of my piano teacher, and she would run him out of town. And she must have, because within two weeks, that guy was gone, and he was never seen again in that area. He was gone. Wow. So she got rid of him, um, and she told me who to go to, Michiko Miyamoto, who was at the time the, the best piano teacher around that area. All her students went to Juilliard mm-hmm. and, you know, and so forth. And um, I got lessons with her, which my parents couldn't afford. But she heard me, and I'll never forget what she said, and this is really intrinsic to my books. She said, you have been taught with the wrong technique, and because of that, you are very tight. All your muscles are completely tight and being used, and as a result, you're in a lot of pain, aren't you? She told just from the way I was playing. She said, I can fix you, but in order to do that, I need a promise that you'll never play anything you've ever played before again, because that's tied to your muscle memory, and you'll never be able to play those without bringing back the old habits. So I need to know that you're only going to play what I give you to play and how to play it. And she says, the payback will be in about a year or two from now. It actually only took six months. I was super motivated. She, she said, in a couple of years, you'll come back to this level again. And you're going to walk right through the brick wall you've, you've been hitting your head against. Because uh, you did a really smart mm-hmm. thing when you hit that wall. You quit. There was no going any further and you knew it. She says, but when you come back to it with a new technique, you're going to walk right through it like mist, like it isn't even there. And on the other side of that wall, there is a world of expressive music that you have no idea even exists. You interested? And it was like, yeah, sign me up. You know, that's exactly it. She got it. You know, she understood what I was saying. And um, I started taking lessons with her. And she not only cleared her entire Saturday mornings for me, she gave me lessons that went three or four hours long. She did it all for $15 a, a week, which was incredible because her going rate at the time for just a 45-minute lesson would have been 65 and that's 35 years ago. And wow. yeah, and her, her musicians, her pianists have what people still today call the Miyamoto touch. In other words, they, they understand musical expression wow. in a way that because of the relaxation uh, techniques imbued into us. So, so that's really, I mean, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have become a musician in the first place, at least not a serious one. And uh, yeah, I really owe that to her. So my second book is actually dedicated to her for that reason. She was the master in my life that changed everything. And so Kalen also finds a master in his life who changes everything because his gift of music is causing him intense pain. Um, so yeah. Tell, us, t- yeah, tell us the background of, of the yeah, story. That, in, that in pretty the- much is the background. The, um, the gift that they had in Ireland before the exodus is, is uh, a gift that would, would only occur to certain people. Um, they had to have amber eyes. That's the one thing they had in common was amber eyes. The Druids did not realize any of this when they came, so they didn't realize what was going on. They did know Mm -hmm. that the bards had mines, you know, mines in the Connemara Mountains, where the mines actually are in Ireland, and they controlled those mines. But how they kept finding new deposits and everything, they they didn't understand. Um, And it was, of course, the gift to their music. I don't want to go too much into what the gift can do, because, again, that's book three. But um, it reminds me of, um, of Anne McCaffrey's Crystal Line. Yeah. Have you read that? Yeah. Well, I've read her, um, uh, let's see, Mercedes Lackey. I've read her Bardic Voices um, series. And it's similar, except it's like, like most people who'd write with music, it's music is kind of the sideline. People happen to be musicians, uh-huh. but they don't go into the power of the music itself. The music itself usually doesn't have any power itself. In my series, the music actually does have an incredible power. There's a gift where if you have that gift, if I, you know, for instance, had the gift of that, if I played something and I was thinking of a memory of mine, a scene, um, a certain location or place that I've seen before, you as the listener would travel with me and experience it as if it happened to you. And that is the gist of the gift so far as the first book knows it. Um, but when they when they did the Exodus and they moved to the Bardic Isles, the gift died out. And 200 years later, it's born again in one boy, a, a village boy who was born with that gift, has no understanding of it, no way to get trained mm. in it, 
Nobody else knows anything about it. And he is just under more and more pain. And for a reason which isn't disclosed till the end of the book, because that's the climax, um, or one of the climaxes, really two climaxes. That's a, a, a definite climax in the book. That's a secret throughout the book that only he knows. Um, he was so wow. repressed at, at a young age that um, that he thinks his music is responsible for something horrible. And so he refuses to give voice to it. And because of that, he is a tortured soul. And until the day that he meets a master bard who comes through his village and uh, happens to have heard him play the night before in the privacy of the woods, because this kid won't play for anyone in anyone's presence. He figures it's too dangerous. And so when the master bard hears this kid's plays, he moves heaven and earth to find him. And uh, when he does, the boy follows him. And that's the whole, this whole first book is that, that relationship of master and apprentice and how, how that develops and how his gift is or is not ultimately freed. So um, that's, that's the first book. And uh, yeah, it, it's just been really exciting. Um, I published it a year ago and a little bit over a year ago. And in the summer, when it got such good reviews and everything, editorial reviews, one of the editorial reviews said, you should turn this into an audio book. And because he says, I want, I want to hear this music. Uh -huh. <laughs> the main thing is with this, you've described the music so cool that this is music yeah. I want to hear. I'm not a musician, but I want to hear it, you know. And so I thought, well, okay, but you're not going to hear it. If you're just going to, it's just an audio book. You're going to hear somebody read the book, you know. But I thought, well, let's start there. So I uh, got a professional narrator, Will Hahn, who did a great job narrating the book. And he was about half. I'm going to write down that name. Will Hahn, yeah. He was about uh -huh. uh, halfway through it when he mentioned to me, he said, you know, I love this book. I want to hear the music. He says, is there any way we can incorporate music into the audio book? And I thought, no, because it's just going to be background music. I don't want background music. Most audiobook readers don't want background music in the book. Um, and I wouldn't either. Uh, but I thought what I would want would be the actual music. You know, the music they're really playing that would involve harp, flute, pipes, you know. Um, and, yeah. and the only way to do that would be if I composed it myself and I am a composer. So I thought, hey, I could write that music. So I did a trial run on some of the music and it it just made the audiobook pop. It made the audiobook really come alive. So it required another two to three months to finish because I already had the published book. And that made life very difficult as a composer. I had to make the music fit what was already existing uh, in the in the book. I couldn't change the text very well. I did change a few things, but you know, you can't uh -huh. make massive changes in it or I didn't want to. Um, so I wrote the, all the music for it and uh, the audiobook was just released in January and is doing great so yeah so that's that's how i've incorporated music into it so for me this is like the project of my dreams it's writing it's composing it's you know lyrics it's voice it's pretty cool so i really really enjoy that uh -huh. it's got um a lot of ensemble music in it so when the ensembles are described you hear the music doing exactly what the voice says it's doing so if the music goes up and produces magic, the harp sweeps up and produces magical harp stuff. Um, it, it's pretty cool. And then That's I got great. some vocalists. I, yeah. And so, so there's also some voice songs that are sung in the book. So I've got actual singers singing those. Yeah. And while we were, um, while we were trying to figure out the technical aspects of this call, I, I jumped on your website and I listened to these four tunes that are on uh, mhimetabooks.com uh -huh. slash music. Um, my favorite of the four is the first one over sea and over stone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think just the, the title emotes to me. And so to, to broaden the conversation a little bit. So with, with my one book so far, there is music is not so central. Um, there is a song that is important in the plot, but the, the song itself doesn't demonstrate any um, any power until the end. A, a little bit. It does have a little bit. And I've I've considered um, having another song play a bigger, uh, more more powerful part later in the series. But I, I haven't developed that idea yet. But um, so in this song, it's uh, it's it's a love song. Uh, that's it's a folk song in in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and I 
I wrote the words myself and I have written a tune and my wife has written a tune. So we have mm. two versions of it. Um, they're not, they're not fully hashed out. They're not developed. We're, we're going to record them. I ran a Kickstarter campaign and in that campaign, I, I promised this recording. So mm. we owe at least one of them to my backers. Um, and now I'm you gotta finish it. To nail that down. <laughs> yes, I, I do have to. I'm hoping to nail it down within the next month. Oh, great. And I, I thought I was gonna get it done in February, but just things have kept happening. But um yeah, it's it's a love song and it's uh forlorn or or separated lovers and the 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 narrator of the song is saying um you know what we Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm trying to talk and I can't remember it at the same time, <laughs> but, um, where, wherever you go, don't leave me alone. Take me mm. with you. I'll come, I'll follow. We're, we're going to stay together. And so this oversee and over stone speaks uh, on, on kind of the same way. Yeah. 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 So I love it. That one, um, is a professional singer. She's a former student of mine, actually not vocally. I can't sing worth anything. Um, but she was a piano uh, student of mine all the way through high school. Uh, went to Harvard, got a psychology degree, decided what she really wanted to do was sing. She was a great singer, always got the lead in the plays and that kind of thing in high school. Um, and so she went to the Royal Conservatory in London, got a master's in musical theater. And then she started singing, singing professionally in London. And right when I was in the middle of doing this audio book, I was thinking, it'd be cool if I could get a female singer, because all the singers in the book are male. So I thought, well, it'd be nice to mm -hmm. get a female singer to sing at the end of the book, when the book is over and sing, you know, over sea and over stone. And um, she happened to send me an email right then just saying she changed her email address and it had her um, website on there. So I visited it, listened to her voice and went, whoa, <laughs> like the next Disney princess type voice. You know, she's got a beautiful voice. So I asked her about it. She was very interested in the project and now she's going to be doing anytime I need a female singer for the end of the book, she's going to do them. She's already done um, songs in minor mode for the second book, the end of the second book. So we have that finished already. And for the male singers, um, I just got a fabulous singer, Ari um, Olafsson from Iceland, uh, because our local singers here tend to have local inflection in the words that they sing. And it doesn't fit Ireland uh -huh. very well, you know. So he does a lot of, uh, of singing over there in Ireland and England and all over the place in that area and can do, you know, can give the right inflection to the voice. And he has a fabulous voice. So... Um, I just got him, so um, I'm hoping to get uh, him to finish the, I think there's three songs I've done for book two that he's going to be doing, one of which is my all-time favorite. You're going to like that one. If you like Oversea and Overstone, you're going to like Voices in the Wind. That's going to be cool. That's okay. a cool one. Yeah, yeah, I look forward to it. Um, wow, so many thoughts. And another thought I had while, while we were talking was... Um, Red Rising is a dystopian sci-fi series, um, which I, I have to say for, for my podcast listeners, because my podcast is clean, Red Rising is not. It's oh. violent and there's foul language in it. Um, but I, I listened to the audiobook, uh, and honestly, it was, it was not so much, it's kind of half- it's not fully entertainment. My, my consumption of it wasn't fully entertainment. It was largely educational. Uh, being in the Marine Corps and being where my inherent nature is a little more timid. The main character in Red Rising is very much not timid. Mm. And he will go and uh, do what he sees needs to be done. Um, so I, I kind of like saw that as instructional like i need to have this kind of attitude mm -hmm. um and you know i'm i'm still learning from it i have to think back on it sometimes and i'm still learning from it but um there is a song that plays a big part in the plot um again just like in well mostly like in my book in my book there there actually is a little bit of power in the song itself um well yeah but in this it's it's sci-fi so there's no there's no like literal power in the song. It's, it's all emotive. Mm -hmm. um, but the narrator sings the song actually 
does sing the song rather than just read the poetry of it. Right. And it's it's not it's not uh it's not a high quality musical performance, which is fair given the setting that it's in. Yeah. When the song exactly. is sung when the song is sung in the book, it's this girl who's about to be hanged. Wow. Uh and her her defiance her final act of defiance is singing this song because it's forbidden. Mm, cool. Yeah, you don't want something and, that sounds like it came from Carnegie Hall, you know? <laughs> you want something that sounds yeah. like it's in the raw, you know, raw emotions, everything going through her. Yeah, I get that. Actually, that's the reason I had Will Hahn, the narrator, sing uh, Burgid's song on there. That would be the last song on that list that you were listening to, um, where he sung songs in, as songs in minor mode. Um, that's actually the narrator doing it. And it's because Bridget is singing it alone in the woods. He's not a professional singer. He's just an older master, you know, who doesn't, singing is not, he's not the voice master of the Bardic Isles. Uh, for that, I'm mm -hmm. getting the professional singer. But for this, for this guy, he had to sound like Bridget. And nobody did. I tried mm -hmm. singer after singer. No one could sound like Bridget's voice. Well, Will Hahn is Bridget's, Bridget's voice. And when he told me he sings for his church, I thought, go for it. Let's just have you do it. And he sounds exactly like Bridget, of course. You know, and it's not professional. And I had to doctor it up quite a bit in Melodyne, you know, get it in pitch and everything. But, um, but it was worth it because it sounds like the character. So I get what you're, what you're saying. That's exactly right. That was, a, that was a good choice. Yeah. For mine, I, I should get a decent. Yeah, I've, I've actually thought about that. So, like, I need to, I need to produce a, a good recording, you know, mm -hmm. like just something that's going to be good and pleasant to listen to um, for the Kickstarter backers at, at least. But when I get, when the time comes to produce the audio book, uh, which I would love to do, it's just, we're not, we're not there yet. I, the book has been published for a month and a half, barely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, when that song is sung, it should probably just be acapella because mm. the first time we hear it sung is around a campfire. Of course, we hear a little silver flute play it. Um, so I need to, I need to record that. And mm. I could record that on my, my iwi, my electronic wind instrument. Oh yeah, um, you could. It has, <laughs> it has different sound fonts. Yeah. And so I can, I could record, um, I could make it sound like an ocarina if I want to, mm. or, uh, yeah, different that's things. cool yeah i had a time getting digital instruments for things like uh the pipes you know and the harp keep i have a good harp so i have a very good digital harp i have a very good digital flute but the pipes pan pipes digital ones sound terrible to me they don't sound anything like what uh -huh. these good bardic harp you know pipes would sound finally settled on a sakuhachi so the sakuhachi digital sounds more more to me like pipes than the pipes do so i've been using that um I can easily get real musicians for the harp and the flute, but not for pipes. Although I do know a Sakuhachi player right now. I just met him. <laughs> so it's possible I could go with live musicians. I would, I would like that. But it's not, unless they're doing an ensemble, even if they're doing an ensemble, actually, it's set to the narrator's voice. Everything has to happen exactly with what the narrator says is happening. Uh, digitally, I can make mm -hmm. that happen. I can make, I can fit it exactly note for note to to what the the narrator is saying. Live performance isn't going to come out exactly the same. You know, the musicians are going to take different liberties here and there and do it a little bit differently. Changing that after the fact on the recording is problematic. It can be done, but it's a lot of work. So I don't know if I'll go with uh -huh. real musicians right now. I'm just sticking with real voice, and all the rest of the instruments are just I do them myself digitally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's just yeah, a ton of fun. <laughs> really, really ton of fun. So you um had you when when you wrote the stories and you published what two books are out so far or uh, one? No, just one right now. The other one is already getting a, a one review that um from the wishing shelf which allows you to get a review before you publish it, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to get that uh -huh. review first, which is supposed to be back within three weeks. At that point, I'll go ahead and, and release it because it's ready to go um, for the paperback and the Kindle version. Uh, the audiobook will be done in, I would say, two months. 
you know, because I'm just now starting to write all the music for it, except for the vocals. I've got the vocal songs already finished. So, uh, and some of the ensemble music. So all the rest of it I'm, I'm doing, it involves about 40 clips of music. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of times, mm. some are really yeah, short, some are, are long. So it depends on what the scene is. Yeah. So that's going to take a little bit yeah. more time, but, um, but I actually first tried publishing Master of Music, the first book, back 35 years ago when I wrote it without I was going to yeah that, without knowing anything. I mean, I didn't have any reviews on it. I knew nothing about the publishing world, just zero. But I knew I, I had read Michael Larson's book on on what you should do if you want to get an you know get an agent. So I read that, did what I thought he was saying to do, and sent it to him. And he he sent it back saying. Very terse, one sentence. Cut this by fifty percent, and I'll look at it again. And I thought, fifty percent, fifty percent. I was going around in shock for a while, and then I made a copy of my book because I didn't trust him at all. <laughs> she, and if it's I, good, then it's yeah. good. Like, well, I took it, and you know, if, I did. You I did what he said. I did what he said. I actually did cut my book by fifty percent. And when I did that, oh, wow. it was so much better, so much clearer, so much more powerful. He did me a huge favor. So I sent it back to him and they accepted my book. Um, then they took it to the big top, you know, all the big publishing houses, right? Now, this is 35 years ago. Uh, what happened then was they sent back very good reviews of my book, which was nice. This is a great writer, no mm -hmm. problem, you know, this, this should be published. But we aren't going to publish it because there's no sex or violence in it. Seriously? Oh, Well, boy. so, yeah, you know, and so the agent said, you know, we don't think your book should have any sex or violence in it. It doesn't make any sense in your setting. And I said, exactly, I'm not doing that. And that's why my books, I just kept writing them and putting them on my computer, and that's where they stayed. Um, they stayed there till COVID. So I guess you've got COVID to thank for these books. Um, COVID yeah. happened, and my oldest daughter is, a, is an also a very well-published author of sci-fi. She um, kept bugging me during COVID. Mom, now you've got time. Now there's no excuse. You know, you get to, me to get those out of your computer and rewrite them and get them ready for publication. Since she knew how to publish, she could walk me through the, you know, what it's like. I mean, I'm a rad, it's just all confusing to someone who's never done it before. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing and she led me through all the publishing of it. So now I do know what I'm doing and I can publish the rest of them on my own. But it's really thanks to her. She bothered me about it enough that I took them out, rewrote them. Um, there are 10 books. The first three are pretty much ready to go. In fact, the fourth is also. But the rest, five through 10, are going to have to be completely rewritten. Because when book three happened, three goes back in the past and really develops the gift. What is the gift? What can it do? Um, and that is so cool that I have to rewrite all the rest of the books based on that. So there's going to be a lot of extensive rewriting I'll have to do before uh, five through ten can ever be ready to go. So hopefully I'll be around long enough to do that. <laughs> my my daughter says yeah. so too. She says if I if I leave early, she's she's going to kill me. So <laughs> so I'm going to have to stick around for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I I tell your daughter that um, you know once once you're gone, she doesn't have to. If, if you say, don't publish these, they're not ready, she doesn't have to honor that. No, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say get these published, but edit them first. She's okay. my editor. She's a fabulous editor. I could not ask for a better nice. editor. So, yeah, she could easily re you know write the books themselves. She just doesn't want to. And she's going, no, don't leave me with all that work. You know. <laughs> Besides, and she wouldn't be able to do the music. So the audiobooks would, would not have music after that unless we got a composer who could do the right style of music for it. You know, yeah, and that's yeah. a that's a huge job. That would be an expensive business if I hired somebody. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, I'd say you know maybe my wife could. Be, she's way too busy. We have three See, that's kids. That's yeah. <laughs> I know it. I, I know where you're going. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> that's exactly why the book sat there for so many years. I was just you know life happens. I had four kids. Was busy. Yeah. yeah. No, I just didn't have the time. But now this is all I want to do. I mean, I I would estimate I do this anywhere from eight to twelve hours a day. I can't stay away from it. It's it's like I'm like an addict or something, you know, but with music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Music and writing. So uh for for personal interest, you mentioned in your email, you mentioned you teach clarinet as well. Uh -huh. You've you've talked about how you went and learned and taught the piano. What's your background with the clarinet? Well, clarinet, 
I wanted to play flute, you see, and uh, that would have tied in real well with the Bardic Isles. But you know, <laughs> but anyway, what I did uh -huh. is, uh, uh, you know, asked my dad, could I could I get a flute because they were starting a, a so-called band in my grade school, and it was all of three people. <laughs> we had one, we had me, a trumpet player, and a flute player. And my dad said, well, we can't afford a flute, but I have an old World War One Bundy clarinet in the closet that had been moldering there from mm -hmm. umpteen years. My dad was a sax player. And so he, uh -huh. um, he said, you can have this clarinet. And he knew enough about it to fix it up, get new pads, you know, do the basics on it. He slapped a clarinet reed on it and showed me kind of the basics of how to form an embouchure. And I muscled sound through this thing and forced it to play uh, and joined that three-person band. Um, so, <laughs> and then the next year when I went to sixth grade, we had an actual, you know, middle school had an actual band. So I joined the band and I rapidly became first chair clarinet simply because I could read anything. I was already an advanced pianist. Reading one note at a time was uh -huh. for me duck soup, you know. So I didn't have any trouble with that rhythm and all that. Nobody needed to teach me that already again. So I had a huge advantage there. But the clarinet, you know, probably the worst I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen some bad ones. So that's saying something. But um, then one day, the lucky day for me, a band director was sick. And in came a substitute mm. who happened to be a professional clarinet teacher, not a band director. So, But he directed our band. But he didn't want to direct the band at first. He looked at the clarinet section. I think he was scarfing around for students, you know. And he said, I want to hear the clarinets play this piece of music. Uh -huh. So he took a, a kind of a upper intermediate piece, I would say, put it on the last chair player, and they couldn't play it. And he kept going down the line and up the line and up the line. Nobody could play it. person next to me could play a couple measures of it, gave it to me. And I played the whole page, okay? So no problem. And I'll never forget what he said. He looked at me and he said, for somebody who who sound, you know, who plays so well, why do you sound so bad? You know? Because <laughs> your band director yeah. didn't know how to teach yeah. the clarinet so, on the shirt. Right. So he grabs, yeah. he said, give me that clarinet. He swipes my clarinet, sticks his own mouthpiece on it. He tries to play it. Nothing comes out. And he tries again. <laughs> nothing comes out. Yeah. And he goes... Blows up just you like Ron Jacobson had. He blew, blew up at the band. He says, "This is ridiculous." I didn't know. <laughs> he goes, "I want you name me your. I, what's your mom's phone number?" So I gave him my mom's phone number, and he stomps off into the band office and slams the door. And we can see him because there's a glass, you know, um, glass thing through it. So we can see him in there. Yeah. He stabbed, you know, he, he wrote rotary the, the telephone because that's back where rotary phones, right? <laughs> and he starts yelling, obviously, into the into the receiver at my mom. And we couldn't hear what he was saying. But I thought, you know, lightning would come down and kill him on the spot because nobody yells at my mom and gets away with it. You know, uh -huh. no way. Then he came out all cool, calm and collected. Started, he says, okay, band, we're going to start at letter I or whatever. And he looked at me and he says, your new clarinet is going to arrive next week. I'll bring it to you myself. <laughs> and I couldn't play a note. I was just going, what? Oh, wow. New clarinet. That guy bought me an R13 buffet clarinet. Top of the line for, oh, wow. yeah. And then he brought it to me, opened it up. Wow. He gave me lessons for 10 bucks a lesson because my parents couldn't afford the lessons. Bought the clarinet himself. And um, and then he, he said, go ahead, take it out, try it out. And I thought, okay, what's so funny, you know, put the clarinet together. I thought, oh, this is a cool clarinet, you know, this sound, it looks so cool, shiny keys and everything, you know, it looks really great. And he says, go ahead, go ahead, give it a spin, you know. And so I thought, okay, so I took my usual mega breath because that's what it took to get a sound out of the old piece of garbage. And I uh -huh. blasted the air through it, and I almost blew myself over backwards. This huge sound came out of this clarinet because it's effortless to blow through it compared to the other. Um, and I just went, whoa, what was that? And he goes, that was a clarinet. About time you found out what one's supposed to sound like. Now let's do something about that embouchure of yours, you know. So <laughs> that's how I got going in that. Yeah. He gave me two years of free lessons. Um, the, the guy was amazing. Oh, wow. So, yes, I had two mentors in my life that were incredible or I wouldn't be able to play either instrument. Yeah. But I didn't go on and That's play that awesome. professionally. While I was in college, I, you know, a piano performance major doesn't have the time. I just gave up clarinet for mm -hmm. probably about 12 years and then picked it back up again when I had a band over here in Hawaii that I could play with. Uh, and 
got talked into teaching it and have been loving it ever since because it's a wonderful instrument to teach and I have ensemble classes that I teach also and that was cool because then I could actually write my own music for them um, and so that I that's how I became a composer and a, an arranger was writing and composing for my ensemble groups and uh, all of that has come together in one huge project with this book so that's what's really cool about it had to wait a few decades but you know it was worth it <laughs> yeah that's, that's yeah. an awesome story and I, this is this is my r13 oh wow i got um, an r13 I've, i i can yes, i can one up I, you i've got a i've got a prestige <laughs> oh nice yeah so i did not grow up with this i found this on reverb in uh 2017 wow maybe yeah 2017 found it on reverb um it needed an overhaul, uh, which I did myself. Wow, that's um, impressive. And, well, yeah, I was I was playing in the Marine bands at the time. Not not the Marine band, but I was going to say you got to be really good to do that. You must be pretty good. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I'm I'm not I'm not that. Um, so the Marine Corps has twelve bands. There's the President's Zone, right. the Commandant Zone, and then ten other bands. Um, and if if you get into the president's zone, like you can audition off the street and you can get into this president's zone. You don't have to go to boot camp. You start out wow. at E6 pay grade, a staff sergeant. Um, but it's very competitive. Like when they had two openings, 150 clarinetists showed up. Wow. Um, yeah, we kind of are a dime yeah, a dozen. There's zone, lots of us. Yeah. Yeah. The commandant zone is also its own special thing that um, they do go to boot camp. They don't have any woodwinds. Oh. Um, and then the 10 field bands or fleet bands are those like, um, if, if you go to somebody's boot camp graduation, well, I was there. I played in that band at MCRD San Diego. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, and, and that band does a lot of parades and uh, civic ceremonies out in town, um, as well as doing military ceremonies, which is kind of the bread and butter of Marine bands. Right. Um, so I, I served a few years in that band, and then I served a few years in the band at Miramar Air Station. Mm. Um, and anyway, so I, I, I grew up with an old Normandy that mm. uh, my teacher told me was probably 50 years old. Wow. Um, and then uh, I, I played that same instrument through college. I could never afford to, to upgrade. Yeah. And then in 2014... Um, of course I didn't have to go and buy a new instrument because if, if the, the Marines will issue you right. required gear, if they, if there's something required for your job, uh, ostensibly in most cases, yeah. they'll issue it to you. And that, that is the case with, with instruments. And so I, um, I played a, a buffet, uh, R13 green line most of the time in the Marines. Um, I had access to, uh, sometimes I played a Tosca. Oh, those are nice. That was nice. Yeah, well. I've had a Tosca um, before. Those are good instruments. But yeah, in 2014, I updated to uh, a Bliss, LeBlanc Bliss ah, clarinet. Yeah. Um, and then a few years later, uh, and you know, this was an important thing for me. Like, this was huge. Like, now I have an instrument that is, I, I bought it brand new. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, a few tuning tendencies that are different from buffet, but it was kind of similar to the Normandy that I grew up with as far as those particular tuning tendencies go. You want to get rid of all tuning tendencies, yeah. but all clarinets have them. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just like, which ones are you going to have right. and how, how bad are they? But um, yeah. So like I, I bought this clarinet and I named it. Uh, mm -hmm. I never named the clarinet that I grew up with. So this one I named Phoenix. Um, cause that's the city where I serve my, my mission for, for the church. Oh. And, uh, so this clarinet was Phoenix. And then, uh, a few years later, I happened to find an R13 for, uh, 750, 800, $850 wow. on reverb. Um, but it was, it was so well priced cause it needed the overhaul. Right. And so I'm like, all right. I said to my wife, like, Lila, I, I, I need this, you know? The, this one does have more tuning tendencies than the R13 does. Um, so, like, yeah, I, I need this. I'll sell Phoenix, which hurt, but that was the, 
the trade off I had to do uh, financially. Yeah. So I I did that, and uh, this is Daisy, uh, mm-hmm. named after the song that when I when I bought Phoenix, um, I just I played around and and my wife plays a little bit of piano, and so we played. Um, What's the name of the song? Daisy, Daisy, give me give your, me your answer, answer, true. Do yeah, um, I'm half crazy. Yeah. Oh, all yeah. for the love of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm dating myself so here, but like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that was like the um, the uh, the introductory song that I played on Phoenix, and so its successor is named Daisy. Oh, that, that's um, neat. Yeah. So when I when I bought Daisy. I was still playing clarinet for the Marines and uh, depending on who the instrument pair technician is at the band that you're at, um, he might let you come in and, and probably supervise you and let you do your own work. And I, I brought my, brought in my own pad set that I bought online. Um, And, you know, he gave me some pointers and, and uh, yeah, I did it myself. Oh, that's cool. That's, uh, that's makes it special. You know, because you've done the work on it yourself. Yeah, yeah exactly right. I just wish I had more time to play it these days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> That's true. Because so I, I left the band uh, a couple of years later, or in uh, late 2018, I left the band. Um, the biggest reason, the biggest single reason was, again, military ceremonies are the biggest bread and butter for Marine bands. Mm-hmm. And standing still. Mm. all the time made my feet hurt all the time yeah um and there were a few other reasons to to make a transition out of the band but i uh went to officer candidate school and uh yeah left left the band so <laughs> since then i i haven't played very often and i i would love to but hopefully um see you can see i'm not on active duty anymore yeah. <laughs> um well there should be some uh you know, community bands in your area that you could join. Yeah, yeah and get, we're get just waiting for, for life to settle down. Yeah, more. like we're we're still we're still settling into this house, and we've we've been in this house for a year and a half, oh. and we're still settling in. Yeah, we still. Um, yeah. So once life settles down a little bit, a little bit, hopefully, I'll be able to go and participate in some of those. Oh, that's great. But, Good. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that, that was off topic as far as <laughs> books go, but <laughs> on topic for music. Music. Yeah. Um, you should know about the um, Clara Neat podcast if you don't already. Do you, are you familiar no, with that? No, I've never never done anything with regard to clarinet on podcasts at all. Uh-uh. Yeah, so the the Clara Neat podcast that's clarinet with an A right before the T, so it's neat. Okay. Um, the Clara Neat podcast uh, with Sean Perrin uh, is gold it's it's yeah. wonderful I'll, I'll I check it podcast. out i didn't even know there was one out there never occurred to me even look for it so yeah good idea yeah yeah and he's he doesn't publish every week you know or, or even every month i think he was doing it every month for a while um maybe he was doing every week or bi-weekly for a while but mm-hmm. i i binge listened uh once i had time um in about 2021, um, I had time and I, I binge listened and, and caught mm-hmm. up and uh, it was just, it was wonderful. No, I'm going to check that so, out for sure. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now let's repeat to our listeners where they can find your books. Oh, and wait, really quick. So you mentioned um, that you had a lot of publishers say, yeah, it's a good book. It should be published, but we're not going to publish it. Because there's no sex or or yeah violence vi- violence yeah um, so a few weeks ago I had an interview with Jessica Flory yes uh, I, I, that. I found her on Instagram yeah yeah she's her her thing is clean fantasy and I I write clean fantasy too I was like that's perfect yeah. you know bring her on just like me too just like you like you have music in your fantasy I'm like right. perfect let's let's have a conversation. Um, and she said that she was really surprised at, at how much, uh, support and interest there has been like, here's yes, clean fantasy. We, we want it. Yeah, exactly. So. I, I was so put off by that, that that's the reason I went with self-publishing because I just figured they probably still have that attitude. Um, judging by what gets published at any rate, you know, 
yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. And my books just aren't, I, I have nothing against that if that's what people like to read and that's what people like to write. But that's, I think there's, there's a whole slew of people out there who would love to have a, just a good story, you know? Just plain a good story. And uh -huh. it doesn't need to be a shock thing on every page with blood streaming down the spine in order to grab your attention. You know, it, it should be the... Re I like relationship-driven books, character-driven. Uh, to me, it's all about the character. I'll read a book that's got sex and violence in it if the character gets... If I can relate to the character. So if the character doesn't come alive, I don't care how good the plot is, how intricate, how whatever... If I don't care what happens to that person, why should I read the book? That's my feeling. And I think there's a lot of people who probably agree with that. But, you know, a lot of people don't. They read it all for the for the plot or for the, the cool tech in a science fiction book or something like that. Uh, but to me, a mm -hmm. great book, a truly great book, has got to have good characters. Characters that are real, you know. And um, I think that's the strong suit of my books is they are real. I mean, these are real people to me that I'm... In fact, I argue with them all the time. You know, they, they, <laughs> they'll want to do something that I don't want to do. That's not where I, I intend the plot to go. And they will argue with me. I have learned uh -huh. to listen to them because they're always right. Uh, they're going to do mm -hmm. what is right for their character to do, what they would naturally do if they were real people. And so I have to listen to that and just allow that flow to go in that direction. Yeah, even if that means the book ends on sad note. And uh, yeah, not all my books end happy. So the first one does, but after that, they don't all. But there's always light at the end of the tunnel, and there's always another book to, to bring things right again. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, and my, yeah, my, my first one, uh, I guess it's probably bittersweet. There's, there's plus and minus, but book two is going to lift things up and, oh, good. and push things along. On the one that, does, that isn't totally squeaky clean? Um, is that one? No, no, so that's the, the one you're talking about, or is that a different different book? So I I write clean. Um, like in my book, there's a little bit of blood, uh -huh. uh, but yeah, yeah, there will be in mine eventually too. I mean, there's going to be a battle. You know, they don't they don't leave Ireland yep. on a picnic. You know, so <laughs> I do have to write a battle scene, and I did, but it's a battle of music. So, you know, it's a music battle. And so, but it's a real battle and there's ships and there's, you know, the whole nine yards. I, I had to figure out how to do that. That's not something I normally write. Um, bad guys, there are bad guys in my book. They just make a brief appearance. No appearance in first book. But in the second book, yeah, the bad guys start to come out. And uh, that was hard for me to write. I don't write about bad guys very easily. So I had to write and rewrite and rewrite yeah. and rewrite and rewrite. And I think now I'm finally getting into their heads enough to write convincingly about them. Yeah. Would, um, would you be interested in having a, another conversation about writing bad guys? Cause sure. I think that's, um, you, you just struck a chord with me on that one. Cause I, um, uh, yeah, well, without getting into it, uh, yeah, let's let's email about that. But yeah. I think we're kind of wrapping up on on today's conversation. Okay. But, Thanks uh, so much for having me on yeah, today. This so was really fun. I enjoyed it. Me too. And thank you for coming. So again, for listeners, that's mhimerabooks.com. That's uh, the website. The, the link will be in the show notes. And Master of Music uh, is yeah, also, Master of Music is available on Amazon. And uh, the audio book is available on Audibles and all other venues you can think of pretty much. Spotify, Google Books, you know, Apple Books, whatever. It, it's on all of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank okay, you. Thank you very and much. We'll catch you okay. next time. <laughs>